Welcome everybody to the next seminar in the IAREP Economic Psychology uh, Seminar Series. Uh, today is our pleasure to welcome uh, Kathy Milkman, who is perfect for this seminar because I was trying to decide whether to present her as a psychologist or an economist, and it was not completely clear, and that's precisely the people we like. So, Cathy has done quite a bit of influential work in what I personally would call prescriptive decision theory. A lot of us do descriptive decision theory more on the psychological side or normative decision theory more on the economic side. But what we should all be keeping in mind is prescription, which is to actually help people with all that that we know. And that's actually what Cathy has been doing. Uh, most recently uh, with the issue of vaccine hesitancy around the pandemic. Uh, so now I see that we have quite a, a lot of attendees. I remind you that we have a Q&A function and that you can type your questions there or raise your hands and then tell us whether you want us to read your questions. Uh, and if not, we'll try to uh, invite you to uh, ask your question personally. And Leo is going to uh, be helping me uh, with all that. And OK, let's get started. Uh, Kathy, the floor is yours. The slides are already there. So it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and thanks for the introduction, Carlos. And I appreciate your confusion. I don't know what I am either. My PhD, if it helps, is in computer science and business. So um, no clarity provided there either. Uh, but I like to hang out with both psychologists and economists and think about problems from both vantage points. So I'm really excited to be with this group. Uh, and I hope you will interrupt me with questions. I will warn you that I got very excited. I have a lot of material. I probably brought too many slides for our time together. So interrupting me throughout is a great idea because that way we'll be sure to have dialogue as opposed to me just barreling through to uh, at the last minute uninterrupted. So I'm going to talk today about the power and pitfalls of mega studies as a new methodology for advancing applied behavioral science. And as you can see, and as I was joking about before we started, I have an incredible list of co-authors, so many incredible people that sometimes I forget some of the amazing people who've contributed. So I just want to give them a shout out. I will try to name some specific names on, on different slides about what people have contributed, but I'll say here that my um, key partner in crime on this uh, work is Angela Duckworth, who's a professor of psychology um, and at the Wharton School with me at Penn. Um, and together we have been sort of pushing towards a new approach to applied behavioral science and leading these studies. Okay, now I've got to get my clicker working. Here we go. All right, so let me just motivate this by talking about a topic that everyone I think on this webinar will already be very familiar with, which is the rise of the influence of those of us who sit between um, economics and psychology uh, and influencing government and policymaking. So one of the most exciting things from my perspective that's happened in the last 15 years for those who sit in this intersection is that suddenly nudge units are rising up all around the world. And in fact, I even have a map that's now five years out of date showing um, how many different governments have nudge units embedded within them. Uh, and this is just extraordinary because if you go back in time to 2010, there were none. So uh, really things are changing quickly and people are eager for insights from psychology and economics, not just economics, um, but the blend um, to, to influence policymaking for the better. Okay, so that's great. Uh, but here comes the challenge that, that my talk, I hope you will agree, can help address. And that is that ideally, policy advice that we offer would be based on field experiments, meaning uh, instead of survey studies or um, you know, archival field data where we're trying to get at causality in a way that might not be um, certain, ideally we're running randomized controlled trials to test whether or not a given intervention we might recommend to government and, or to policymakers could have the intended consequence. But there's a bunch of problems with this. So the first is, this is really hard to do. <laughs> Running field experiments requires enormous fixed costs and it's slow. It's slow going from the time you talk to a partner to implement. Anyway, I probably don't have to tell most of you, it can take years and years. Um, even when we have field studies to look at, even right when we have, oh, you know, a lot of work, I'll just pick a topic where there's been a particularly large amount of work done to encourage more savings. Um, we still often have to compare effect sizes across studies. 
um, in order to say what's the most effective way. So you might want to look at matching or um, ma matching savings contributions, or you might want to look at default people into savings. But often the best evidence we'll have will be in very different populations. One study may be done in Denmark, one study done in California. You know, the, the demographics of the population is entirely different. So if you look at the effect sizes, you're not really going to end up being sure which is going to be more impactful necessarily if you deployed these tools in the same population. So ideally, we'd be able to make apples to apples comparisons instead of apples to oranges ones. Another key thing that I think is really important to highlight is that the replication crisis, which has gotten more attention in psychology uh, or has media attention, I would say, to the crisis in psychology than uh, necessarily a crisis in economics, but it affects all disciplines that we tend to publish uh, results that are positive and tend to have a file drawer of results that aren't. Um, that can mean we expend enormous resources just replicating other people's failures without knowing it. And we're not always sure what's robust. And so that's an issue as well. Okay, so what's the solution? That's what I'm going to talk about today. And I want to say this is not the only solution. It's a solution that I hope will advance um, what we can do in this area. And that is uh, to, to start running what I call mega studies. Uh, a mega study is a very large field experiment in which many smaller sub experiments are being run synchronously with the same dependent variable. So instead of a single team of researchers having a hypothesis about, say, what might increase savings rates and, and testing it with a con control condition and treatment condition, so that might be your sort of blue condition A and condition B, what we do is we go out to dozens of scientists and say, what is your hypothesis? And maybe one says, oh, let's test you know, matching, another says let's test social norms, another says let's test defaults. Each group has a different insight and they design their standard treatment and control, or maybe, you know, multiple treatment arms that are related. They design a test and they still have their own standard study, but then it gets pooled in a mega study with all the other researchers' ideas with the same common independent variable being measured. Um, excuse me, the same common dependent variable being measured. So the outcome is the same, maybe savings in the same population over the same time period. Randomization happens across all of the different study conditions, not just your own study conditions. Um, and as a result, now we can make apples to apples comparisons. So you can sort of compare this with a traditional field experiment, which would just test a single hypothesis. Uh, and now we're, we're pooling many. Okay, so what are the benefits of doing science with a mega study? Uh, the key one that I've highlighted already is that it allows for comparability of results across studies. So now if we want to go to a policymaker and say, here's the most cost effective or simply the most absolutely effective um, way to approach this problem, we are making apples to apples comparisons. We may still have ties for the very top performer rate, but like a Bayesian might say, okay, this is my, um, the one I predict will have the best results. Um, it also ensures that the fixed costs of executing these really expensive studies can be borne by a single centralized organizer, which can lower the marginal cost of entry to doing this kind of work for other scientists. So I think that's exciting that maybe we can increase the access to running field experiments by having sort of single organizer, just the way a, a behavioral lab might lower the fixed costs of collecting data for all the researchers who wanted to collect survey data. It also reduce, reduces the risk of learning nothing useful from a field study, right? If you pull 50 different ideas, and even after you know multiple comparisons, uh, corrections, it's, it's very likely that you're going to find something useful at the end of the day, uh, and also might allow researchers to take greater risks so that they test sort of wackier ideas that you might otherwise not see going to field. And it also can eliminate the file drawer problem, because what we've found is that it's feasible to to publish mega studies where we um, write about both positive and negative or null, I should say, results all uh, in one paper. And, and we sort of um, air all the dirty laundry along with the good news. So that's helpful. It can also be a way to get more interdisciplinary teams interacting. So the way that we design our mega studies is we'll put out this invitation and each team has its own hypothesis and theory and runs their field experiment as an island and can publish that result alongside maybe additional follow-up studies to probe at the mechanism or whatever else is important to them in a paper that focuses on the theory that the, is being tested in their, say, two-cell design. Um, but then 
they're being run alongside all of these other groups and they'll end up co-authoring a mega study paper with others. So if you want to publish in the QJE and another group wants to publish in psychological science, you might never normally interact, but here you can each have your own study embedded inside the mega study and, and at least see what other people are thinking about across disciplines. Um, I will say that I'm not going to share exciting results on this, although I, I hope that in the future I will have some. And this is something that we're very excited about but haven't really delivered on yet. But the idea that um, basically we can explore heterogeneity and, and not just say what's the average best performer, but work, what works best for whom. And um, I'm using the language of medical uh, researchers here and saying this allows for behavioral phenotyping, meaning, again, figuring out what's the best um, policy approach for different subpopulations, not just what's best on average. So when you test a much wider array of interventions, you get um, more opportunity to do this. And finally, this should really accelerate the pace of scientific discovery relative to the usual one study at a time process to the extent when there are um, pressing policy questions, we want acceleration. Uh, I just want to point to like enormous amounts of past research that we're standing uh, on here. Uh, we're sort of on the shoulders of giants, but I'll point to a couple of methodologies that feel particularly relevant or particularly similar. Um, one is the common task framework, which was adopted by AI researchers of now about 15 years ago, where uh, it used to be that if you were an AI researcher looking at, say, an Im image recognition problem or, or speech recognition, you know, whatever problem you had, language, large language models, um, you might just work with your own data sets and try to sort of figure out how can I make this better and better. And that created a lot of friction and made it hard for people to compare the performance of different algorithms. And so what researchers came up with was a common task framework so that everybody working on image recognition would sort of agree to use exactly the same data sets for validation and the same validation method. Um, and they'd have total transparency in terms of the hypotheses tested and results. So you could make really apples to apples comparisons of different algorithms. And that created a huge acceleration of, of um, progress in this area. So we think of that as very similar. You could also think of sort of common paradigms we use in the experimental economics literature, right? Like the ultimatum game or the prisoner's dilemma is having a similar flavor, but they're also, of course, the participant pools are different. Uh, scientific tournaments also have a very similar flavor where, uh, you know, different groups are brought in to sort of compete with one another in order to try to see who will generate the best results, but they don't tend to involve random assignment. So we're sort of trying to take the best of these different insights um, in building mega studies. So what I'm going to do today in our remaining 45 minutes together, and again, please do feel free to interrupt me with questions, uh, is I actually brought four different mega studies to share with you. I'm not going to obviously go into enormous detail and depth in any of them, but I think I'll go into enough depth to give you a flavor for the power of this methodology and a few insights that will hopefully make you excited um, to you know, read and dive in more and think about what are next steps. And the, uh, the four mega studies I'm going to talk about today are actually all health related. Um, the first will be the very first one we ever did, which was a, a mega study to try to promote greater exercise among members of a massive gym chain in the United States called 24 Hour Fitness. And then I'll actually pivot to three studies we did related to vaccinations and encouraging vaccination that were motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The first two were actually done focusing on flu in the fall of 2020, designed to accelerate insights that could then be rolled out to influence COVID um, vaccination campaigns because we realized there was a pressing need there. Um, and the final one was done this past fall um, to encourage COVID boosters. And I have that marking fresh because this data is um, really brand new. This is the other two, three papers are now published, although some recently. Um, this new data, it hasn't been submitted yet. So I'm particularly eager for feedback on that, though I, I would welcome feedback, of course, on all of it. All right, so let's start with the 24-hour fitness mega study. I'll say this is the stalest of the set because it's um, it's been out there a little while, but uh, it, it's the grand beginning of this adventure. And so I wanted to share it briefly with you at least. Um, and you might say, okay, if you're setting out to do this new methodology, you want to encourage behavior change, think about policy relevance. Like, why are you studying exercise? Is that the most pressing policy challenge of our time? And I, the answer I would give you is no, it's not. I don't think it's the most pressing policy challenge of our time, um, but it has another number of nice features. Um, this is, I realize this is a global audience that I'm focusing a bit here on Americans, but, uh, but the same things I'm saying really apply um, across populations. So in the US, but globally, people don't exercise enough. And exercise has unbelievable 
health benefits. It doesn't make you skinnier, which is a misconception, but it, it makes you live longer and it, it makes you live a higher quality life. It's very, very good for us. And we don't do enough. In fact, 9% of premature global uh, mortality is due to insufficient physical activity. So we do want people moving more. Um, but I have to admit the real motive, besides it being a policy relevant problem is it's a neat opportunity to measure a repeated high frequency decision objectively. And in some ways, if you look at what people who study habit have done most, this is really sort of like the fruit fly for habit researchers is gym attendance because of those features, right? We can't study diet easily because it's self-report. We can't study smoking easily or medication adherence again because of these self-report issues, but we have this really nice um, outcome when we look at exercise. So we're going to go to the gym and we're going to run an experiment with all of the members of this 4 million person chain in the United States uh, being invited to participate. Now, that does not mean they will. It required opt-in enrollment, which is going to differ. The next three studies I'll show you are going to be, uh, they're just going to be everyone in a population enrolled. So this has selective participation, which is something you should keep in mind as you think about the data and the results. But everyone who was a member was invited. They uh, were invited to register for a program designed by scientists to create exercise habits. They went to a website if they wanted to register. And we ended up recruiting about 63,000 participants, which is is um, orders of magnitude larger than any gym experiment that's been run before. Uh, the population is not representative of the people who need to exercise most. They're already gym members. Um, most of them have been for a long time. The average year since joining is three and a half. So I, I want to just say, if we think about extrapolating these results, we have to be pretty careful. Um, my bet is that actually we see bigger effects in other populations, but I have no way to prove that. Uh, that's just my, that's my instinct is this is sort of the least malleable kind of population we could work with, but they do have room to grow and that they're only visiting the gym a little bit more than once every month, uh, despite being longtime members. So clearly there's a reason they're signing up for this program. Okay. So when they sign up, they go to a website and, and most people are mo signing up on mobile, which is why I'm showing this in a phone, but of course you can sign up on a desktop or a laptop as well. Um, and most people are they're encountering a website that's been designed by professionals to look like, you know, any kind of habit building program you might sign up for. You know, popular ones in the U.S. are things like Noom or WW. We're trying to emulate that experience, so this feels like a professional uh, program. The terms and conditions are a consent form, and then um, sign up requires giving an email and a phone number that you validate, as well as your name, so that we can link up um, with your uh, gym membership and we can communicate with you during the program and deliver incentives and text messages and emails. So what we had is uh, 30 different scientists who participated in the generation of different research studies embedded within this mega study. Um, they created 20 different pre-registered research studies that uh, involved 53 different experimental treatments. We also had a placebo control condition. So there's 54 conditions I'll talk about today. The placebo control had people sign up and then they were randomly assigned to um, basically receive a message saying, welcome to the program. They got a very small cash transfer immediately that was equivalent to the earnings we expected people to earn in the other conditions. And they didn't hear from us again until the end of the 28-day program with a conclusion message. So placebo really gets nothing, essentially, except a little um, transfer of resources. And then scientists who were designing the different treatment conditions, they could vary the sign-up surveys that people saw when they right after they clicked consent and gave us their contact information. They could show them videos, ask them questions, um, give them instructions, tell them about incentives they'd be exposed to. They could change the incentives received for going to the gym and for responding to text messages sent throughout the 28-day program. They could design reminders that would be sent to participants after days when they said they planned to exercise. And then they could also design up to three interactive text messages sent per week, as well as weekly emails sent once, um, once a week for the 28 days. Okay, uh, in addition to having a placebo control, the team that was uh, designing this um, with myself at the helm, we decided we would also create a sort of best practice condition, which took insights from past research and said, what are the things we're pretty confident should be useful in increasing exercise? Let's package those into a condition and see if um, scientists can beat that. And the things that we packaged together included a prompt for people to make a plan about the date and time when they intended to exercise on each day of the week. So you, you look at a weekly schedule and you say, I'm going to go at 3 p.m. on Mondays, 5 p.m. on Wednesdays, and um, 9 a.m. on Fridays. Now you're going to get reminders at those times, actually 30 minutes before those scheduled exercise times, um, as well as a weekly reminder of your planned gym visit schedule. And you'll also get micro incentives every time you visit the gym. Now, 
micro incentives means you're getting a cash transfer of about 25 cents every time you visit the gym. Um, why are they micro? Well, because we didn't have the budget to make the macro. Most gym incentive programs have involved far larger incentives than this, but we just couldn't afford that. And so we thought, well, maybe, you know, even if it's a small amount, it's still, uh, you know, going to draw attention. Let's try it. So you got a quarter per gym visit. Um, and then uh, the teams designed all sorts of different treatments. Now, if I went through all of them, that would use the rest of our time together. And what I'm going to do instead is sort of highlight the types of things tested. I'm going to show you the global set of results and highlight a couple of top performers. But you get you can get a flavor from sort of looking at some of the ideas here. There's things like commitment contracts being tested, designed by economists, or incentives for rescheduling missed visits. Um, as so, a lot of people played with incentives. But then there's lots of psychologists designing things that are focused more on mindset or um, signing a pledge, uh, committing to certain amounts of time without money on the line. So there's all different ways that people are trying to increase gym attendance. And after people enrolled in their, uh, in the program, they were randomly assigned to get different experiences. So the first screen they saw told them about the rewards they would encounter. And these were, by the way, delivered in the form of, um, Amazon gift cards. So people are, are getting points that are convertible for gift cards, um, at the you know penny level. This is the planning screen most people saw to plan their gym visits. Um, and then most AV tests got inserted at that point. And then you're told you're all set, although lots involve changing the reward screen as well. And then people, again, they get reminders before every scheduled workout. They get reinforcement of whatever the key idea is of the treatment designed by the researchers that were interactive text. So I'm showing one here that's a, uh, a, a study designed by Ayelet Fishbach where she's trying to encourage people to do things that are fun at the gym, as opposed to things that will be particularly effective for their health. And you can just see this reinforcement shows she's texting and saying, hey, did you do an exercise you enjoyed? Reply yes or no. If people said yes, great, keep it up. If they said no, they're reminded, wait, you're supposed to be choosing exercise you enjoy. And then finally, these weekly emails would again reinforce the key treatment idea and remind people of their schedule. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you a graph that by the end of this presentation, this format should become pretty, you, you'll get kind of used to looking at it, but it, I want to spend a moment preparing you for, uh, for what you're going to see. So on the x-axis, what I'm going to plot is the increase in our, and this is a regression estimated increase in weekly gym visits um, during the four week treatment period. I'm going to plot dots that show you the regression estimated increase, and then I'll put whiskers around them for the 95% confidence interval. And the blue line is showing you where the placebo control condition is, which is zero, because we're estimating um, increases relative to the placebo control group. And then you can see on the y-axis, the names of all the different treatments we tested. These have been rank ordered in terms of their estimated performance. Um, the bolded name just shows you our uh, sort of best practice control that we generated. So now I'm going to show you a distribution of effect sizes. Uh, and um, and so this sort of shows you our set of results. So there's a few things I want to highlight about this graph. Um, the first thing is that almost all the dots are to the right of the placebo control. So that's good news. And that basically all, all of our treatments save one, at least directionally increased gen, uh, exercise. So that's really exciting. We're, we're pleased that we aren't, you know, just doing things that are useless. Um, another thing I want to mention is that um, you might think this is just a normal distribution shifted a little bit to the right. Uh, it's not quite. There is uh, differentiability between the um, dots that that's non-random. Um, so there, there's significant variation in the performance of the different treatments. Uh, and then, of course, you, you can see I've highlighted the planning reminders and micro incentives condition. You can see um, it's sort of in the middle of the pack. So it was pretty darn hard to beat significantly. Uh, only a few treatments actually were able to outperform what we felt was the common best practice. So that we gave that bar, that was a very high bar. So 45% of treatments outperform the placebo control at a p-value of 0.05. And of course, if we were just throwing darts, we'd expect 2.5% um, to do that. Um, but only 9% outperform that best practice control. And here, actually, I haven't, so you could think about, oh, how should we do the multiple comparisons correction? Right here, what I'm doing is sort of giving you the sense of the multiple comparisons correction globally. Um, but in, uh, as we go forward, I'll be doing some, um, some more specific corrections, but basically you can think, you know, 45% that, that can, should convince you pretty compellingly that this isn't noise. Because of course, okay. some okay. would. 
Yeah. Oh, you, yes. You, you, you just, yeah, and you just answered the first question as well from from Sidi. That was about the multiple hypothesis testing, but she also followed up uh, whether you have bundled treatment effects, or would you expect any interaction effects across the treatments? Um, it's a great question. In this particular experiment, we didn't bundle um, any of the treatments. So, um, like, we didn't say like, oh, let's do this plus that. But in some of the studies going forward uh, in the very last one I'll talk about we we have a bit of that but in this in this study it really is independent teams doing independent work um, the only kind of bundling we did is if we saw two teams that proposed a really similar set of interventions we would basically team them up so that we didn't end up launching the same study twice because we felt that would be inefficient yeah okay I'll just Great. tell you about some top performers to kind of whet your appetite for or get you excited about what we learned. Um, the very best performing treatment, and I, here I'm, I'm shouting out the PIs of this, um, John Bashirs of Harvard Business School was the lead on this particular study. We were looking at um, how to try to basically prevent people from falling off the wagon, meaning like you miss a gym workout, can we prevent you from having that missed workout that you would plan to make accumulate to two misses or three? Um, and what we did here is instead of just paying people 25%, 25 cents a gym visit, if they missed their, say, Wednesday visit and their next scheduled visit was Friday, well, if they came on Friday, they'd earn a whole nine cents more than the usual 25 um, for not missing two visits in a row. So it's sort of a one-time bonus for not letting your um, miss accumulate to two. Now, nine cents should not be uh, enough to really change anyone's behavior about anything, right? I don't even think that covers the gas to drive to the gym in um, most cases. So this is not probably about the huge incentive we've offered, as opposed to trying to uh, give people the message that you don't want to let a miss accumulate. You don't want streaks of misses. And this turned out to be the most effective treatment we deployed. It increased gym visits by about 27% during our, um, our program. Um, the second best performer, maybe not shockingly, uh, was just we had one condition. This is also John design, um, the same researcher in the top couple. Um, this, this was actually a control for something else where we just multiplied participants' earnings by an order of magnitude. So these people are being paid roughly $2 a gym visit almost, um, as opposed to 25 cents. So uh, turns out standard incentives, amping them up, that works. Great. Okay. So like, we're not crazy, but it's kind of neat to see that this uh, streaks sort of don't fall off the wagon is basically just as good as paying people 10 times as much per gym visit. And then the final one I want to highlight that I thought was pretty neat is uh, a project that was led by one of our research assistants, along with the great Bob Cialdini of Influence um, fame. Uh, Bob has done some really neat work showing that people uh, are very motivated by the norms in their population, right, that we care a lot about what others are doing. And in particular, he has some more recent research showing that we care about trending norms. So when not only do we want to know what the majority of others are doing, but when we see an uptick or a trend, we're particularly motivated. So he designed a truthful treatment, you know, sort of slicing survey data from Americans, um, showing that there was an increase in the number of Americans exercising over time. Um, and the study was run in 2017. So you sort of project out uh, the 2015-2016 trend, and you can see that uh, you know there's growth, and that was the third top performing, uh, which also out outperformed our best um, best um, our best attempt at sort of putting together what we knew before. Okay, so I want to turn away from results to actually talking about something I thought was almost as interesting in this project, and I'm going to come back to this in each of the projects, which is. Is it predictable what works? And so why do I care if it's predictable? Well, if we could just ask people, here, here's a bunch of different ideas a policymaker might want to try for increasing exercise, which do you think will work best? And some population could tell us, then we don't need to spend all this money to run a mega study and do all this work. We just deploy the forecasted best performers, right? Maybe we could let the market um, predict. So we tried a few different studies to see whether or not basically the science is necessary, if people can predict these results. Um, one study was done with prolific workers to survey respondents online, and they made an average of um, 17 predictions each. So, you know, we're basically letting people choose how many they want to predict and randomly assigning what treatments they see, and they, they get a little information about baseline gym attendance. Um, we also did this with professors who we thought would have expertise, particularly in exercise. So these are professors from top schools of public health and specifically in the departments focused on studying exercise science, which is a field. Um, and these folks, uh, 156 of them, made an average of nine predictions across the 53 treatment arms. 
And then finally, we also got some practitioners from companies that specialize in applied behavioral science research. So think about organizations like the Behavioral Insights Team and Ideas42, who are literally often working with embedded in governments to try to decide what to roll out. So we're going to look at all those predictor sets. All right, let's start with the prolific workers. And what I'm plotting here on the x-axis is the actual treatment effects that we observed. And on the y-axis, I predicted, um, I've shown you the predicted treatment effects on average across all of the participants. So two key things to jump out to you in this graph. The first is that the actual treatment effects are dramatically, dramatically smaller than the predicted treatment effects. So people are, are way too optimistic about the benefits we're going to see from these uh, interventions. And then the second thing you should see is there's a slight positive correlation, but it's not quite standard significance. And, and it, it, it sure doesn't look like we're excellent at rank ordering, but it's not terrible. There's some signal in the prediction. So that's kind of exciting. Okay. Now let's move on to the experts who are presumably going to do better, except no. Uh, so here we are with the public health professors who are trying to predict what will work best. The actual treatment effects are still overestimated though by slightly less. So we're getting a little less optimi overly optimistic, but still an, off by about an order of magnitude. Uh, oh, sorry, not an order of magnitude, uh, off by a factor of about um, three. Sorry about that. And then um, three or four. And then uh, we have no correlation in terms of rank ordering. So just throwing darts. Uh, and now let's come to the behavioral science practitioner experts. A little bit less overly optimistic still, but still too optimistic about effect sizes. And now again, um, no signal, if anything. In fact, they're close to significant, they're, you know, inching up towards significantly negatively correlated with actual results, um, but it's really just noise. But so this is not working well. Now let me put it all together for you and show you in another way. If we go back to that sort of plot I'd shown you at the beginning, those are the blue dots. And now we've actually done a weighted average of the three sets of predictions weighted equally across the sub pools. You might want to weight it differently, but just for visualization's sake, you can see there's zero correlation across the three sets of um, predictors. And you, you can just see basically this is noise that's wildly too optimistic about um, what will work. Um, I see another question. I don't know if you want to interrupt, but I didn't. I, not seeing what it is yeah we can we can take it um maybe the vote do you want to ask a question yourself i will unmute you so then we hear another voice you should be allowed to talk now i wait a second and then i will just read out the question no, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, he said he can. Oh, yeah, read it out. Um, first one is: Did you have questions related to initial mental health condition of participants? And if not, are those individuals recognizable from your pre or after treatments, like giving up or ignoring messages and gym attending information? So questions on mental health. We don't have any indicators of mental health. Um, it's a great question. Uh, the real issue is that even if we could have measured, we probably could have measured it in enrollment, but we wouldn't have had a reliable way to measure the outcome. Uh, it's part of the reason the gym data was so appealing to us is honestly the measurability of it. Um, and, and any kind of survey question, we knew we'd have very low response rates, except in that initial survey, but that's before delivering treatment. So I guess we could have gotten a measure of mental health wellness and then looked in, to see whether or not it um, predicted performance of the treatments, but we didn't, we didn't do that. Sorry, it is a good question. Maybe I can follow up that this is quite shocking, the results of these, uh, shocking in the sense of how, how little effects there are compared to what the public, anybody essentially thinks. So, and also that some researchers didn't manage to create any effect size that is meaningful really. So what's the reaction that you get when, when you show people these types of graphs? If, if politicians might say, oh, what are behavioral scientists doing? The researchers themselves say, oh, you showed that what we did is not effective. So do you get some critical reactions there as well, showing these results? Sometimes, but I think it's pretty quick and easy to debias that because um, we're getting largely positive results at the uh, cost of about 70, 75 cents per intervention. So these are incredibly cheap. And if you actually look, there was a recent um, review paper by Liz Le Elizabeth Linos and um, Stefano Della Vigna that I really like that came out um, right around the same time as this that was reviewing the performance of different treatments across nudge units and actually showed something pretty darn similar um, when they did a meta-analysis, which is people are much too optimistic about the effect size of treatments and um, that, you know, at a very low cost, we see pretty pretty um, consistent results in the order of, mag actually their effects I think were a bit smaller than our average treatment effect that they were seeing from mailings and so on. So um, I think 
basically it's important that we recognize that, that we're probably a bit miscalibrated in our expectations, maybe in part because of uh, the fact that we have a file drawer problem and that, that results that get published tend to be the positive ones and you don't ne normally see the null results mixed in. I think it's great that, you know, only one treatment was even a, ne a negative point estimate. I actually think that's pretty incredible. Um, because some of, and some of these things were control conditions, remember, rather than really treatments, because everybody's bundling their treatment and controls into one study design. So uh, I, I'm not terribly dismayed by how effective these light touch interventions are. I'm excited about the fact that we have a few things that worked quite well that increased gym attendance by 30% at a cost of 75 cents per um, intervention. Uh, so anyway, I, I take a different tact, and I, I think it is really important to debias the public on the effect sizes that we should expect to see from light touch interventions. They don't change the world, right? That's not, it's just not what happens. You, if you if you wanna, you know, get people to stop driving um, fuel inefficient cars, you can't nudge them. You need to change regulations. So we should have realistic expectations about what can be achieved with these kinds of light touch interventions. We have a follow-up question on that by Dave Comerford, uh, who is asking whether you are concerned that behavioral scientists are so wide off the mark when making their estimates. Absolutely. I am very concerned. I think that's really important. And it's a theme that's going to come up um, again. And, you know, that again, it's, it's another reason, even though it wasn't in my initial list of why we should do these mega studies, I think it really helps to publish these um, full sets of effect sizes. And again, I, I mentioned the paper that I like so much by Elizabeth Linos and Stefano Delavigna, because I think when we're constantly reading about the big results that are, of course, there's selection bias and what in big results, right? There's, there's, um, we're getting the wrong impression of what's really feasible, whereas these mega studies give us a, a full distribution of what we should expect. And I'll show you many more null results, but also some exciting ones. Uh, so we, we see the mix. There's diversity in the performance, and um, and we need to be better calibrated through evidence about what works and how much. And maybe since we have interrupted you anyway, Linda Desso is uh, asking whether you can translate the effect sizes into a measure of actual health benefits. Yeah, that's a great question. We do that a little bit in the vaccine studies. In terms of increasing exercise, um, we're getting people to go to the gym. Uh, let's see how much more this I'm like, sorry. we're getting them to go to the gym, maybe one or two more times a month. Um, and then this is only over one month. So you'd have to sort of like say, okay, we're going to extend this and do this over the course of years. Like getting someone to go to the gym a couple extra times in their life doesn't matter. But if you say, decide that you wanted to roll out a 75 cent a month, uh, program as an employer, or as a government, um, and get people going and exercising at that rate, then I think you could expect, you could do back of the envelope calculations about, you know, how would that help with heart disease and mental health and so on. Um, so we did not do that because that's, I think that's beyond this, but, uh, you know, they wouldn't be huge benefits, but I, I do think it would be reasonable. We actually, part of the reason also was budgetary constraint, but we also benchmarked the price tag we wanted to spend by doing a little back of the envelope on sort of like, at, you know, what is the value of exercise at a yearly basis and like what's a reasonable cost that you might imagine a government wanting to incur to increase physical activity um, and, and 75 cents a month to get extra gym attendance did seem reasonable based on there's there's calculations about this, but anyway, they, it makes different assumptions and it depend on the population, right? Is it somebody with heart disease? Is it somebody older Then the benefits are bigger? Maybe this doesn't make sense to roll out with 18 year olds or college athletes. Uh, so you'd probably want to think about that carefully. But there are definitely populations for which this would be reasonable. Okay, let me let me do key takeaways because I'm realizing I'm like, oh, I have uh, 20 minutes-ish left, right? And I have three more studies I want to share. Although the others are going to go much faster than this one because there was a lot more setup needed for this. So don't fear, we probably will get through most of it. Um, key takeaways here, hopefully you'll remember we're really bad at predicting what will work in advance. Um, and, and also way off on effect size. I think that means that doing this kind of work is even more important than we originally anticipated because we were really focused on the apples to apples benefits in terms of cost effectiveness. And, and it also has this sort of um, realism component that it's gonna help us appreciate what are the real effects of, of all these things. And then um, look at low cost, really low cost, we can increase gym attendance significantly. I think that's exciting, but maybe you think it's depressing that it's not bigger. I think these are fine effect sizes um, and and, reasonable when you look at some of the things in the literature that cost a lot more. 
So you might be saying like, oh, where would you go next? And I will say that we have um, mega studies it, cooking or um, not quite written up yet in K through 12 education, trying to get kids doing more math um, with financial savings. But the next three studies I'm going to talk about are a setting that I think everyone will un immediately intuit the importance of, which is um, vaccination. And really, as we were looking at the landscape in the spring of 2020, right after we all went into lockdown, um, we were starting to see everybody recognized then that vaccines were probably going to be our, our way back to normal out of the pandemic. And there was a lot of fear that of those vaccines, despite that. And again, this is U.S. data, but I think there were similar issues. I know there were some similar issues globally, though. Maybe we were one of the worst in terms of our vaccine hesitancy. Um, but you could just see over time that people were not that jazzed about taking the vaccine. Um, and there was a lot of focus on speeding up the development of vaccination um, technology and figuring out how we scale up distribution supplies. Um, distribution channels, but not so much talk about how are we going to get the behavioral science right on communicating. So my collaborators and I wrote a piece in USA Today, which is the most widely circulated newspaper in the United States, basically saying, hey, we actually need the same kind of at least some major investment to try to get the vaccine rollout right in terms of communication. P.S. Obviously, we still didn't get it right. Um, and also, there wasn't a major investment in this, but we did lead the charge on a couple of mega studies, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So both were focused on flu vaccinations in fall 2020. Everyone involved recognized that the goal of these studies was actually to develop interventions that would be portable and useful for COVID, but COVID vaccines weren't ready yet. And we wanted our insights ready when they came out. So we're using flu as sort of a related um, type of vaccination um, to see if we could encourage that. So the first one's gonna focus on people who are going in in the fall of 2020 for a healthy checkup with their doctor and are gonna be offered a flu vaccine at that checkup. Then we'll go to the pharmacy setting where people are um, being encouraged by their pharmacy to come in for a vaccine. So this was with two large health systems in um, my region of the United States, the North uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic region. So Pennsylvania based in particular, Penn Medicine, which is my employer, and then Geisinger. Well, I'm employed by Penn, not Penn Medicine, but you get the point. Okay, and all of these patients are coming in for a new or routine primary care visit at um, one of these health systems. And the experimental design is quite simple here. Patients are just gonna be randomly assigned to one of 20 different experimental conditions, determining which text messages, if any, they get in the three days leading up to an appointment. And we're gonna have about 2000 people per conditions, which you're gonna see is not very well powered. I'll have better powered studies after this. Um, this is a more typical population than the gym population. So here there's no sort of opt out. It's um, it's everyone who's agreed to be communicated with via text by their health uh, provider, which is most people. They're mostly getting reminders also, by the way, about the appointment. And this is gonna be a message that's focused on accepting a vaccine when it's offered to you. Um, the vaccination rate in our holdout control group, which is gonna get reminded to come into the doctor, but not reminded to accept a vaccine is gonna be 42%, which is pretty much on par with the national average in the US. All right, again, I can't tell you everything we tested, but I'll give you a flavor for it. Um, we were all over the map with different ideas from, you know, what we dedicate marathon runs to loved ones, why not vaccines, especially if, you know, we're doing it to protect others in our family. Um, what if we made this lighthearted and told people a joke about the flu? Have you heard the one about the flu? Don't spread it around just to get people thinking about it um, and having sort of like that earbug, uh, telling people to do it to protect others. Uh, and one group was focused on the idea that um, we might want to make this feel like it's more of a default. It's already been reserved for you. Therefore, it's recommended. It'll be hassle free. OK, so um, you're used to this now, right? The X axis is going to show treatment effect relative to usual care. Um, so the dots we want to be to the right of the blue line. Uh, I am not going to show you every single intervention here, just a sort of sampling. Um, but again, everything's to the right of the line, but actually significant. Um, there's only about 32% of interventions outperforming the usual care control, significantly so. Uh, the best three performing um, messages all use the reserve for you language. The joke and doing this for others, even though they were popular among forecasters, I will just say kind of tanked. And just to show you, um, these are this is sort of the best performer. You got two text messages, one three days before the appointment, one 24 hours before. You can see that reserve for you language. This is very uh, sort of traditional messaging, 
Uh, a few key takeaways on this. I'm actually not going to show you prediction data for this study. I'll show it for the next. Part of the reason is that there isn't much differentiability because we were underpowered for that, but there's going to be a lot more differentiability in the upcoming studies between the treatments. But here we do see that reminders can help, that the reserve for you boosted vaccination by about 11% and survives multiple comparison um, corrections easily. Uh, and then when we sort of do a bit of a meta-analysis on this, what we see is that all basically all of the ones using this reserve for you language rise to the top. So that's a very significant predictor of success. And then the other thing that's a predictor that matters a lot is um, things that were surprising, casual or interactive really underperformed relative to others. The more clinical sort of formal communications was much more effective. And also actually Elizabeth Linos and Stefano Delavigna, who I mentioned earlier, have an analysis of um, nudge unit data that's not published yet, but actually shows something really similar in that um, context. So that was interesting. So let me turn to the second mega study in this set where we're going to have dramatically more statistical power. Um, and this was done with patients at Walmart pharmacies. So here we were restricted to only patients who'd received a flu shot at Walmart in the prior year, which isn't ideal. Uh, we didn't have that sort of restriction on the pen medicine, but this was related to legal constraints on who you can message and what would be seen as marketing. Anyway, so it was a limitation. Um, patients here were randomly assigned to 23 different conditions, and we're going to test some overlapping things, but some different things, because now instead of trying to get you to say yes when your doctor offers you a vaccine at a, at a patient visit, we're going to try to get you to you know hop in your car or walk to the nearest pharmacy and ask for a vaccine proactively. So it's a different goal. And the messages went out on September 25th of 2020, and for up to three days after that, they could get up to two messages. Um, and there were about 30,000 people in order of magnitude more per condition. So we're gonna be able to do much more to differentiate between the performance. And the sample size is about um, almost 700,000 people, fairly uh, a little older, a little more female in the US population, but that's actually, well, those are the people um, getting vaccines at a slightly higher rate. And we're gonna only see their vaccinations at Walmart pharmacy. So we're missing data if they get it elsewhere. Um, which is important. So we're gonna see a lower absolute rate. So what did we test? Again, quite a range of ideas, 22 different messaging strategies, commit to getting a flu shot, get one to protect others. A, a shot is waiting for you. They wouldn't let us use reserve for you here because uh, they were worried about stockouts, but we ended up with waiting for you as a very similar type of message. We used a Cialdini ask, sort of more Americans getting a flu shot than in the past, it's going up. Um, this is one of my favorites was sort of let's use people's misunderstanding of correlation versus causation to make it more attractive to get a flu shot. We'll tell you people who get the flu shot are healthier, wealthier, and better educated. So don't you want to be one of them? Um, all of that is true, but of course it's not causal. So how did this work? All right. So here's our, our, our graph. Um, we want to beat that, be to the right of that blue line. These are regression estimated effects. And first of all, now we have great power. Everything outperforms the control. That's exciting, 100%. Um, we can, you know, we can correct however we want. These results are very stable. Um, interestingly, that sort of waiting for you language, three of the top four, four performers used it and the rest didn't. So we're really seeing this ownership language is rising to the top in both studies. Um, more Americans getting the flu shot than in the past also worked quite well. Um, telling people to do it for others, Telling people that healthy, um, you know, the wealthier people get it. Those were a couple of the bottom performers. So good thing that we didn't trust my intuitions. And really simple language. This is the top performer. It's so boring. Um, so incredibly uncreative. And yet this is really what's doing the best. So, um, you know, that's what we recommended rolling out. So can we predict this? So here we had... Um, Prolific workers tried to predict, they made lots of predictions. And we had actually, in this case, the team scientists who designed different treatments tried to predict what would work best. And actually the prolific workers were quite good at differentiating. So again, they thought that they were off in terms of estimating the size of the treatment effect on the actual treatment effects they thought would be bigger um, than they, they were. Predicted means um, estimated, I should say, regression estimated treatment effect. Actual is on, um, oh, sorry. I'm saying that all wrong. Actual is on the x-axis and predicted is on the y-axis. And um, so you can see that their, their predicted treatments, they thought a few things would be negative, but they're going up to a nine percentage point increase. Um, and that, we're not seeing effects that big. 
Unfortunately, team scientists were completely terrible at predicting this. So interesting to see that non-experts really outperform, which is different than a lot of past um, prediction work, so showing experts outperform. But maybe it's partly because the people who are prolific are more like the people who are going to get this. And we saw that again in, in the gym study, too, that in terms of rank ordering, there's more um, cal there's better calibration on rank ordering by lay people, lay estimators, and then there's better calibration in terms of effect size by experts. So that's quite interesting, I think. So here, what we see is that using this um, ownership language is going to be is the winner again. We also saw that messages sent repeatedly on multiple days instead of a single day outperformed. So nagging works, um, and the prediction results were a little bit better here, but still scientists couldn't predict relative to performance. Um, and uh, the top performing message was tended to be mispredicted. So that's even by the best forecasters. So that's a, another thing worth noting. So just if we really want to get the top performer, we probably still need science, although we could go to prolific workers to get a little bit of a better sense of what has the most potential. Okay. And then in case you're wondering, well, did it work for COVID? The good news is that some members of our team went and ran an experiment right after the vaccine rollout to use this ownership language and compared it to other standard reminders and showed indeed that it outperformed. So that was exciting to see this validated. And almost every um, pharmacy across the U.S. used language about um, vaccines waiting for you or reserved for you this past um, fall, which was really exciting to see both for flu and COVID boosters. Um, and there was more validation um, in another study actually by another collaborator using this to try to get healthcare workers to go in for their required vaccines uh, and accelerated that by telling them they had been reserved for them. Uh, in case you're also curious about that particular the theory behind this, the research team that developed this messaging approach did a series of follow-up experiments in many settings, not just with the COVID vaccine and um, focused on one particular mechanism that's partially driving the effect, which is the implied selectivity of being told something is reserved for you. In addition to the idea of a default and a recommendation, there's a selectivity mechanism. And this is working with you know, concert tickets, Kindle books. Um, so that's that was exciting to see them sort of take this first study and then run with it to, to show it mattered elsewhere. Okay, I have six minutes left and a little bit of fresh data, but let me just pause because I think I'll at least be able to show you the, the key punchline, even if I do. And I see there's one question. I don't want to shut that down. Oh, I don't see what it is. Uh, yes, we had a question. It was uh, actually a bit ago uh, about uh, persistence. So whether what more about the first study, really? whether uh, there is any way to know whether the effect would be persistent in time rather than a one-off thing that would wash off. So for the vaccines, I don't think there'd be persistence, but I suspect that was a question motivated by looking at the um, gym yeah. data. Uh, and part of the reason, by the way, that we moved to the vaccines is we were like, oh, this is a great place for behavioral science where we don't need to see persistence because persistence is hard to drive. We did look at persistence in terms of just looking at um, the months following the end of our intervention period. And we see a pretty standard habit formation pattern where the um, for every extra gym visit induced by a treatment, we see about a 30% carryover to the 10 weeks post-intervention. So there is some persistence of the effects even without continuing to deliver treatment. So I am making an assumption when I say, well, what if we, you know, kept treating people for much longer? Um, you know, we'd have to, we'd have to see to find out whether that would continue to work. Um, but I, I am fairly bullish because we don't see any decline at all. Uh, well, we don't see massive, we don't see any meaningful decline um, in the treatment effects, at least during the time period of our study. So, but that would, future research should really look at that. There's also a question that I think would interest many people, but David de Buissonge. Uh, David, do you want to ask it yourself and trying to allow you to talk? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. I can. Okay, great. Uh, Katie, thank you. It's uh, uh, inspired me a lot, the whole idea of running mega studies. And in the Netherlands, uh, I'm currently thinking of uh, running mega, mega studies ourselves. So uh, the steps that I've identified uh, are to find a group of interested researchers, uh, then find companies who might be interested in partnering. That could be commercial companies, could be healthcare providers, uh, could be policy organizations, uh, and then secure funding for the research. So my question was, from your experience, what are the biggest obstacles or opportunities uh, moving forward with this idea that we should take into account? 
Oh, um, well, one, the coordination is a pain. Um, you know, it's, it's challenging to sort of um, figure out uh, what, you know, how do we make sure we got good ideas, a wide range of good ideas, and that um, they're sort of feasible to test. Um, I think the biggest opportunities, though, are moving away from some of the light touch tools that we've been using. And I'm, I'm going to sort of move in that direction with this very last thing, which I'll, I'll show you in two minutes. Um, I, I would like to see, um, you know, not just cheap or free interventions essentially tested. I mean, it's not free to send a text message, but practically, you know, we're seeing results and benefits, but it would be exciting to see some heavier handed policy tools tested and evaluated in this way that might be able to lead to even bigger um, amounts of, of behavior change uh, for the common good. So to me, that's a big opportunity that we haven't gotten to do. It's, it's been mostly text messages and emails um, and light touch. Right. I can see the benefit of having a more uh, longer duration intervention with more interaction with uh, people. So I guess some companies have apps that would allow that. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or bigger incentives than we were able to deploy in our initial project. Um, so I would love to see those kinds of things. Or social interventions. We're, we're eager to test sort of when you put people in groups and, and create group interactions um, and group incentives. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. great. Related to that, Katy, because you have been uh, pushing mega studies as a new instrument for science in general, um, not to sound to sound too critical at this early stage. I think it's a wonderful instrument, but I'm just slightly worried that it might introduce a rich country bias. Uh, I mean, in the sense that uh, organizers are going to determine the questions that get asked. And organizers are going to come from resource-rich countries, uh, which have the power to invest the resources in all this organization. And that's going to determine which questions uh, actually get uh, attention in the end. Yeah. I mean, I think that's already an issue with field experiments because those are expensive too, but it bec could become a bigger issue. On the other hand, if organizers are motivated to um, try to be more agnostic about what they include as opposed to, and, and I should say, we didn't curate these ideas much beyond put, pooling teams. We basically took everything that was feasible to implement because we didn't want our biases about what we liked best to influence. So we weren't like, oh, I like that idea, not that. It was more, this is illegal, so we can't implement it, but or it's not feasible. But if it was technically feasible, we implemented. So to the extent that organizers try to be a bit more agnostic and really open up the platform, it could have the opposite effect too, um, it, because it may make it lower cost for people who are outside of rich countries to do field experiments. So I, I think the bias could go either way. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't say that we have done a great job necessarily. I just think it's also a possible leveler of the playing field um, to the extent that these are opened up. Um, so, okay, I have one minute left. Let me sort of just like give you the real highlight reel and say, we did a massive experiment this past fall and we wanted to test more than just text messages. So we also tested the benefits of um, free rides. We wanted to know whether those interventions, which were widely, um, there's a lot of spent on them in the US, do they matter by reducing friction? And this is sort of more of a theoretically motivated specific goal of a mega study. And then, um, you know, we, we know from nudge research that small transaction costs matter a lot. And then we said, oh, well, well, while we're doing this, let's make it a mega study and compare the effect of free rides with some other simpler, cheap interventions. So this involved 3.5 million pharmacy patients, um, and they were being encouraged to get COVID boosters this past fall. I am not going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to show you all the different things we tested. Instead, I'm going to just skip to the results and show you um, key things, which is Actually, the free ride had no benefit at all over and above reminders, although everyone thought it would. Um, so it, it was of zero added value over and above simply sending a well-designed text message. And we had a fair amount because of the great power of ability to look at um, different effects. We could lead to a little bit of like a 1.2 percentage point increase in vaccination, which is about a 20% increase. These were very low take up vaccines at the point in time when we rolled this out. Um, and the best performer encouraged people to make a plan and told them the date or recommended to them coming on the day of the week at the time of day and the location where they most recently received a vaccine from this pharmacy. So a personalized plan. Um, we are testing now whether just a default that was popular would be every bit as effective. Um, we also told people about high transmission rates in their personal county uh, or high, excuse me, high infection rates 
Um, and that was almost as, as effective as in statistically indistinguishable. Trying to tell people about misinformation was definitely worse. People did not want to hear about, you know, facts from the CDC. So that was also useful to learn. Um, okay, so uh, let me, and we couldn't predict this at all. People thought Lyft free, free rides would be great and they aren't. Uh, there's some interesting heterogeneity. You'll have to wait for the paper to find out about. And I want to wrap up a minute late, but they are two minutes late. I apologize for that. I hope I've convinced you about all these benefits of mega studies. What I haven't done very well is talk about the, there are limitations, but they came up a bit in the Q&A. They're very hard to implement. So you need these centralized um, resources, large sample sizes and coordination. And then I haven't talked much about the winner's curse, but that is something we have to be aware of. And, and we've spent a fair amount of time thinking about the right adjustments for the multiple comparisons and the winner's curse to get estimates that are likely to replicate um, when you do this sort of thing. And that's more, more in the papers. So thank you. I'm sorry to go a couple of minutes over, but I really appreciate everyone's interest and time and great questions. And thanks for the opportunity to share this work with you. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, we didn't have time to ask all questions, but uh, there is something that uh, an anonymous attendee very appropriately is asking and which was going through my mind, which is the, the impact on publication practices. So, for instance, we have the question that it might be hard to determine individual credit, which could be harmful for junior people seeking a permanent position. I bet that the anonymous attendee is an economist. Uh, where these kind of issues uh, are I, we've quite important. About, we've thought a lot about that. So the way that we hope people will publish is not just in the mega study, which I agree when there's 40 authors, it's hard to give a lot of credit to the, um, you know, 37th author. Um, although people, PS, are very happy to be getting, you know, proceedings of the National Academies or Nature paper, I've noticed. But um, the goal is really actually for each individual study also to be published as its own paper, and that's been happening too. Uh, and that can be led by the uh, researchers as opposed to having 50 co-authors. It's a much smaller team. And then there can be a theoretical development section that explains the meaning of the, the particular intervention, follow-up studies, further data on heterogeneity within that particular set of um, treatments and so on. So I think that's, that's where we're trying to create an incentive compatible um, system that uh, allows more junior researchers to get the credit they deserve for their good ideas. Hope that makes sense. Thank you, it does. Um, let us give the word to our president, Vera Rita, for the last question. Vera, if you want to ask a question. Thanks, Carlos. Hi, Katie. That this is amazing. Thank you very much for being with us. Oh, and uh, I, I was so impressed because uh, this is like a meta discussion of the area that's leading you guys to devise this method that is also incredible. So I, I have so many questions, but we're running out of time. But I want to congratulate all of you. Um, the whole group of researchers could be Nobel Prize nominees, in oh. my opinion. And uh, no, <laughs> no, this is this is great because uh, there are so many challenges in the area, and you're trying to address them with this brilliant idea. So congratulations, and I hope sometime we can further discuss all this. And thanks for being with us. Many Thank thanks. you for the very kind words and for your excitement about this. And um, I hope we'll have a chance to discuss it in the future too. And I should just say, uh, good. I have an amazing team and I didn't give nearly enough credit because I was so focused on the results, but I feel very lucky to be working with all the extraordinary people who made this possible at the Behavior Change for Good Initiative and all the scientists who contributed their ideas. So um, it really has been yeah. an amazing opportunity to work with a, an incredible group. Great, Thank you for having great. me. Oh, no, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.